Hey everybody, how's it going? I am your host, Adrian, coming to you almost live from lovely Petaluma, California, here in Studio MC2 at Quicksurf Internet Studios. The Geekinator is a proud member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Do feel free to head on over to techpodcast.com and check out all the other technology-related shows over there as well. I'd like to encourage everybody to visit us online over at quicksurf.com. You can shoot me an email, geekinator at quicksurf.com and uh, please do subscribe to the show if you have not already done so if you have thank you for subscribing uh in the show notes for each and every episode i have links to subscribe to an og vorbis feed an mp3 feed and a video feed as well you can subscribe to uh youtube we're up on youtube blip.tv daily motion uh stitcher radio and tune in uh, the links for all that is also linked up in the show notes. So uh, do feel free to subscribe over there if that's your preference. Uh, this is episode 42 of season five. It is the last episode of the fifth season. We do 42 episodes per season of the Geekinator. We all know how special the number 42 is. If you don't just uh, read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy or uh, watch the movie if you want the Cliff's Note version, if you will. Um, so the next episode next week will be season six, episode one. I know we don't really make a big deal about these sort of things. The numbering just seems to happen and we just do the shows however uh, they uh, flop out uh, in, you know, whatever order or sequence. But uh, I thought I would mention it because uh, this will be the sixth season with 42 episodes per season. So not exactly a small number of episodes. Uh, same thing for Linux News Log. I mean, we've been doing... Uh, tech shows in general since 2004 so we're going on nearly 10 years believe it or not not regularly i've i've uh you know life happens and since i'm a one-man show i've had to uh kind of take hiatuses here and there to to because life happens and if i don't do it it doesn't happen you know <laughs> so sometimes i i can't do it anyway um with that being said Let's go ahead and get into the cool stuff for this episode uh, over at PC World. Open source project Pixie aims to give vision to hobbyists robots. I saw this and I thought this was pretty neat. An open source project aims to give a rudimentary eye to robots with the help of a camera that can detect, identify, and track the movement of specific objects. This is pretty cool. The Pixie camera sensor board being developed by Charmed Labs and Carnegie Mellon University can detect objects based on seven colors and then re report them back to a computer. A Kickstarter campaign was launched on Thursday, this past Thursday, to fund the $25,000 project, and the organizations are on pace to reach full funding by the end of the day. Adding the Pixie could be viewed as giving robotics basic vision, said Rich Legrand, founder of Charmed Labs. Once you have vision, you can introduce the idea of tasks. Um, this is not unlike, uh, you know, other robot vision type things. They have a photo of a, a pixie attached to an Arduino microcontroller. Um, believe it or not, an Uno, just like uh, this Uno here that I have here. I uh, do have, believe it or not. Uh, an Arduino here. I've got a variety of electronic stuff. You can't really see my desk, but the camcorder is sitting on my desk. But I've got, you know, a couple of breadboards, a couple of uh, Arduino things, some power supply. There's like a whole pile of stuff. <laughs> I might have to take a picture one of these days. Anyway, I thought this was really neat and I thought I'd bring it up to uh, my audience. Definitely something to look into if you do a lot of uh, robotics type work or Arduino type work. Pretty neat. From Mashable, robot fights brain clots. That's right. When a person has a blood clot in certain parts of the brain, surgeons must weigh the pros and cons of whether going its removal, uh, of whether its removal is worth the potential damage that might occur to the surrounding tissue. That delicate dilemma is why researchers at Vanderbilt University have designed a special robot that could suction away brain clots while minimizing damage to the brain. This is pretty neat. Um, definitely check it out from the verge breaking bad and mad men photographer warns that digital cameras can be too clear. Now, granted this guy shoots with medium format film cameras, which, 
you know, that is an obscene amount of resolution, even in digital land. Anyway, uh, Frank Ockenfels III uh, has built up a glittering resume of photographing some of the best-known actors, musicians, and celebrities around. And though you might not have heard his name, you most surely have seen his work. Spider-Man, Harry Potter, Hellboy, Thor, and Sylvester Stallone's Expendables crew are just a few of the characters he has immortalized with his camera. Most recently, Ockenfels worked on a promo imagery for the final season of AMC's Breaking Bad, which was one of the main topics of discussion during an interview he did recently with Pop Photo. Um, on the technical side of things, the photographer admits that medium format cameras are the only option for him, owing primarily to the need to produce enormous pixel sharp images that would grace billboards across the world. Surprisingly, however, he doesn't use the highest end models. And the reason he gives is the higher resolution ones are so high resolution that they almost have to retouch the sharpness out of them. Clearer than film, clearer than real life even, these digital monstrosities are so powerful that, in his words, you can almost read what someone is thinking. Ockenfels concludes the, by saying that you shouldn't be able to read a hair inside the tear duct of someone's eye and encourages aspiring photographers to work with what they have on hand instead of worrying about the equipment too much. Now, this is coming from a guy whose you know, gear that he uses is several orders of magnitude above what you and I have access to. You know, I shoot with a Canon Digital Rebel. It's a Digital Rebel XTI. It's a little bit older. Um, the only time I really use this camera is when I'm going to be shooting... Uh, something uh, that I would consider archive quality. It's 10 megapixels, so it's not terrifically high, but the beauty of this camera when you shoot RAW is you get a 12-bit RAW file, so quite a bit more dynamic range uh, support uh, than something like an iPhone camera. You know, the, the Digital Rebel has quite a bit more highlight headroom than any, you know, even point, a lot of point-and-shoots. So, um, anyway, but the camera, that, the cameras that this guy uses is still several orders of magnitude above that. But one thing that I have noticed just in my own personal experience is 35 millimeter film in general, uh, even for still cameras right around the eight to 10 megapixel range. If you can get approximately that in digital, your quality wise, you're about on par with what 35 millimeter film is. If you want more quality than that, you kind of need to go with bigger film. But anyway, pretty neat. Definitely check that out. Uh, from Mashable, 53 gorgeous sets of flat eye, flat design icons. I thought I'd bring this up uh, simply because I, you know, like nice, clean icons. And these are some pretty cool looking icons. Definitely, there's a lot of creativity going on. Um, definitely check it out. From Electronista, Google is saying that Gmail users should have no expectation of privacy. Well, so I'm kind of split on this. I'm not surprised. And my response is, well, yeah, you're using a public service and a lot of your internet, a lot of your emails flying across the internet in clear text anyway. It's you, realistically, you don't really have any expectation of privacy. However, with that being said, uh, I, I do kind of somewhat expect some amount of privacy being, you know, the average Joe can't just go look at, you know, my email. The story here, defending itself against a class action suit in Judge Lucy Coe's San Jose, California federal courtroom, Google has circuitously admitted in a court filing that users of Google services should not have any expectation of privacy. Citing a landmark court ruling from 1979, the search engine giant has reaffirmed that people who turn over information to third parties, such as Gmail or other search engines, shouldn't expect that same information to remain private. In its filing, Google claims that just as a sender of a letter to a business colleague cannot be surprised that the recipient's assistant opens the letter, people who use web-based email today cannot be surprised if their communications are processed by the recipient's ECS provider in the course of delivery. Indeed, a person has no legitimate expectation of privacy and information he voluntarily turns over to third parties. Wow. 
That's all I'm going to say. Uh, again, it's not surprising, but still, really? Okay. From makezine.com, this is a little bit older. It's from August 10th. It's like a week old, but I still thought I'd include it, you know, in light of the whole NSA and Edward Snowden stuff going on. Uh, they have a really awesome YouTube video here. Turn the inter internet off with the flick of a switch. And basically, it's an internet kill switch. Pretty awesome. Uh, you essentially, between your, your router and your modem or, you know, between a, a specific computer and a router, it's basically a box. It's got two Ethernet jacks in it. You plug your computer or your router into one you know, and your, your, your cable modem into the other, and there's a switch and you flip the switch and you are physically no longer connected. It's, it's air gap at its best. Um, pretty neat. Definitely check the video out. I thought this was awesome. I may actually be implementing something like this. So definitely check it out. From the verge, Apple to show a new iPhone at September at a September 10th event. Uh, this is uh, kind of, a again, a little bit older, a little bit confirmed news, but I thought I'd talk about it. Um, there's a couple of different models of the iPhone. They're looking to come up with a low-cost version, which makes sense because their model now is essentially, you know, they release an iPhone. Like, for example, the iPhone 5 is the flagship model. The 4S is the $99 model. And then they have an iPhone 4, which essentially with a two-year contract, you can get for free or 99 cents or very low cost, like a couple of bucks on AT&T for a while. They had it. You could get it for 99 cents or something like that. That's actually kind of expensive. Um, you know, Apple, I think they're seeing the, the wisdom in having a low cost iPhone that they can sell at that 99 cents or pay for, for pay as you go plans where it's a relatively low cost phone and iPhone four is still relatively expensive. And so Apple is seeing the, I think seeing the light that, you know, it doesn't make good business sense for them to keep the same phone. Like when the iPhone 5S or 6 or whatever the next version of the iPhone comes out to basically make the 4S the new 4 and the 5 where the 4S is now, you can get for $99 and, you know, vice versa. They, they'll probably keep the last flagship phone and their new flagship phone and then just have a cheap phone that doesn't get updated as often or maybe it gets updated once a year and it just has less features or that sort of thing. So I'm curious to see what they're going to do. Uh, same thing for the iPad stuff. I'm curious to see uh, what they're going to do for the iPad stuff. Um, should be a pretty interesting event. I've been kind of hoping that, you know, they would, would uh, and it looks like potentially they're going to take all their iOS devices and make all the iOS stuff, uh, you know, a, a September type-ish release that, you know, the, all their iPods and stuff like that, they've, they've, you know, that's been kind of back to school holiday type uh, release iPhones initially were in June and they've kind of pushed those back to September and iPads were initially like in February, March, and they've slowly kind of pushed those back. So it's looking like September is going to be the iOS, uh, you know, the, the iOS month you know, the iOS devices month, and hopefully uh, that will free up some bandwidth for the rest of the year for them to do other categories of uh, devices, you know, worldwide developers conferences during the summertime. That's where they can really uh, focus on, you know, they'll still do some iOS stuff because it is a developers conference, but that's where they can really focus on the, you know, the Mac platform that frees up, you know, two other quarters essentially to do other releases really one other quarter because the last quarter of the year is holidays and people oops, sorry uh people do you know a lot of the shopping then it doesn't make a lot of sense to release something then simply because it takes a while to get the distribution going and all that good stuff so um if i view it as it essentially frees up a quarter for them so should be pretty interesting i'm curious to see what they're going to show That'll do it for this edition of The Geekinator. As always, everything we've talked about is linked up in the show notes. I realize the show is a little on the long side. We're uh, right up there around 15 minutes or so. So uh, please do subscribe if you haven't already done so. The next episode will be the first episode of Season 6. And with that, I will see all of you then. Thanks for subscribing. See you then. Bye.